Welcome to America's Top Rebbitsons. May this class be for Rafua Shalema, for Devir Ben Hagit, Eden Bat Aliza, Eden Bet Orin, and Elat Bat Rachel. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to us on the America's Top Rebbitsons YouTube page, or click follow to follow us on your podcasting app so that you are the first to know when an inspiring new episode is posted. I am very honored to have on today's show, Rebetzin Dasi Biggio. Rebetzin Dasi is a co-director of the Chabad House in San Andres, Colombia, the country of Colombia. She and her husband, Rabbi Mordechai Biggio, serve as a local Jewish community and also Jewish tourists. So they serve all the Jewish people down there in San Andres, Colombia. They provide them with all of their basic needs of Judaism, which I think is so amazing. Your community and the Jewish tourists to San Andres are really, really lucky to have you. So thank you so much for being here. Please tell us more about yourself and what you do. Thank you, Vera. Um, so my name is Dasi Bigio. I have four kids, four boys. And uh, since the last year, we've moved to San Andres, which is an island in Colombia. Uh, we used to be in Medellin, which is a town in Colombia, which is very big. And in the past, um, uh, one last year, we built a new Chabad house in the island. So I have this uh, kind of a change in this uh, kind of a shlichus because we started to have a community and before we only had like tourists, Israeli tourists, other tourists from uh, from uh, New York, from Panama, from all these countries that are around Colombia. Uh, but now we also have a community, which is a which is a different kind of uh, activities, but we do both. So it's it's amazing combination with the tourists and the and the community, and this is in a general um, history of my doing in this world. That's amazing. I love that. So before you were just serving tourists, now you're serving tourists as well as the Jewish community. So it, there's a Jewish community on the island, like right on San Andreas Island. There's a Jewish community there. Yeah. So basically, before we came to the island, we heard a lot of. Uh, People are talking about this island, which is looked like paradise, and it's it's so nice. But there's no kosher food, there's no uh, synagogue, there's nothing there for uh, Jewish travelers. And we wanted to come to check out the place. And the only people that we could reach out on this island was uh, Jewish people that lived there for many many years. Actually, the the first the first person that really connected with us. Was it was as an Israeli old man who called Pini Pinchas Gabai. He lived there for more than seventy years. Wow. He's an Isra Israeli person. He came from Jerusalem to San Andres. I don't know. Don't ask me. So that's <laughs> what, a story. <laughs> what's the story? Because it's it's amazing. I don't know how he came there, but he came there and he lived there and he's uh, he's speaking Hebrew. And he was like very happy. Yeah, come here. We need you. We need a synagogue. We need uh, prayers. We need Shabbos. We need everything. And we were very pleased because he he really welcomed us. Um, then we came there just to check the place for two weeks. And the first Shabbos we announced, we had like 20 people coming from the street, like Jewish people who traveled wow. there. And then we had a meeting with the community, which is like 30 families that live there. The, most of them are very old. The most young people in the island are 50. They, they have three little children, but most of them are very old, uh, but very nice people. So they welcome us in a very warm way. And we started to do the activity very fast. We, we find a place, we, we build a system. And now we finished the synagogue. We just finished building the synagogue, Mazel which is though. very, <laughs> very excited for a first year to finish the synagogue. It's it's unbelievable. Wow, that that's amazing. So that's part, part, we're going to talk about part of that today. So um, we're really going to talk about the the commandment, the Torah commandment of honoring your father and mother, which plays into this. So um, I to begin, I want I know that your father had passed away a few years ago, and you opened up this Chabad house that you were just telling us about in his honor. This uh, new Chabad house that you were just talking about. It's in honor of your father who recently passed away, and I think it's such a gorgeous way to honor him. So I want to see if you can please tell us about your father and the lessons that you learned from him, and also 
um, I would love to hear the story about how you came to open up the new Chabad house, like everything that was involved in that. Okay, so everything is really connected to the honoring of my father. Awesome. We actually had the the um, the coronavirus that go goes that went all over the world, and we felt like we need to go to Israel. I had a I had my my second child. I went to Israel to have to give birth, and at the moment when when I came the the covid started so all the flights were canceled everything was closed the 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 sky were closed so i understood i have to stay in israel and actually it was a very nice um i would say it was a very nice time to be with my family and to be with my father and a few months after i gave birth he he passed away he had a stroke very fast everything was very fast i couldn't really realize what's going on and he just passed away. I was very connected to him and all my life uh, were about shlichos because my parents, when they became Baal Tshuva, they uh, started to to hear about Chabad, about everything about shlichos and they started to be shlichos themselves. They came to a little colony in Israel called Gedera and they started their Chabad house here in Gedera. And I grew up on uh, I grew up on their activities like they, they had a shiurim they had lessons all, all the time in the house and people were always welcome in my house every Shabbos we had guests it was kind of it was part of my life it never was um, something new for me so when my father passed away I felt like I need to do something really big for my life and I have to start my own journey and uh, in honoring him. And we we have we've searched for another place to open a Chabad house. We already have a Chabad house, but we were two families and we felt like we need to open another one, like to concrete another place in Colombia. And we have heard about this place called San Andres. I was very worried about the place because it's an island. You have to take the flight. You have nothing on the island. You have no hospital. You have no doctors. There's so many things that are missing in this island. But I felt like maybe, maybe this is the shlichus. Maybe this is the the difficult, I'm, the challenge I'm looking for. Right. So I felt like in honoring my father, he really would love that I would be in a place that that people really need. So. The other family that were with us in the Shlichus, they stayed in the town and we moved to the island. And I felt right away that all the blessing is coming right away for us. It, it was the difficult was there is always difficult where you when you start a new Chabad house. But we had such a great blessing that I felt my father is like holding my hands and he he, got, he comes with me every step. And I felt his blessing in every step we took. And that's why we, we, we have accomplished a lot of goals that we wanted to do in only one year. It was amazing. I couldn't believe we had already a Chabad house. We already found a, a place for a synagogue. We already find, we found so many things and so many ways were open. And I felt it's a blessing from my father because it's an honoring for him. Right, like he was watching over you and kind of helping you and guiding you along the way. Yeah, yeah. And then what, what do you do for kosher food? So I make everything myself, everything from scratch. Wow. It's funny, I just took to a, a couple of, uh, a group of uh, women. I, I made like a lesson for a woman that are widows. And they told me, how, how do you do this? How do you host 70 people every Shabbos? And I said... I'm I'm cooking the food. And they said, okay, maybe you just buy the salads. You buy the salads and you just cook the food. No, I, I don't buy the salads because I, I can I can buy the salad. There's nothing on the store. I have to do everything myself. Like I, I, I buy the vegetables, I buy the flour, I do the I do the baking, I do everything from scratch. So it's it's a challenge, but that's how I eat more healthy. And that's how I challenge my my cooking skills and my baking skills. 
Wow, that's amazing. And and what about meat? Like, do you have to get it flown over or do you go and buy in bulk or how do you get the meat? Yes, we have to to get it from, from a flight. We have uh, actually, we have a town called Barranquilla in Colombia and the uh, shliach there, he's a uh, shochet. Okay. He, he's processing all the meat, all the, the chicken, everything, and we buy from him. But he comes in a flight and it's very complicated. We have to buy a very special, um, I would say it's a f- freezer that you can send it. Right. And it's a box of freezer. And then th- that's how you, you get the meat. And then you get also the milk like this. But okay. there's no meat. There's no meat and there's no milk. You also, you you have to to fly both of them. Wow. And just to clarify, for anybody who doesn't know the term shohat, it means um, he, he kills the chickens and he kills the cows himself. Like he's the, he's the butcher, in other words. The butcher, yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. So you make everything from, from scratch. Do you like to cook? <laughs> I don't like to cook. Okay. <laughs> I don't like to cook. I love baking. I okay. really love baking. But my my husband is really good at cooking. Oh, amazing. So I, he is cooking sometimes. Most of the time I cook, but I, I learn a lot from him. He's really good at this. Okay. So. Amazing. Amazing. So it's good. So you're, you're a team, like you cooperate, you do some things, he does some yeah, things. Yeah, we, we get... have to, we have to be, it's only, it's only two of us. It's only two of us and the people needs to eat. So we have to make the food. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. No, it's beautiful. I think it's very, very beautiful. And I want to talk to you about something of some of the other life lessons that your father taught you. I mean, it's so gorgeous that he's like really guiding you from above because it, in a year, you're right. You found everything yeah. so quickly. It takes people. And I know, I know personally, it takes people multiple years until they find the building, until they get all the permission from the, from the authorities, from the government, until they get the contractors to build everything. It's, it's many, many years, you know, many years. I have my I have my experience in the other Chabad house, the the first one that took us a lot of time to find the place. Yeah. We renovated. Yeah. We we had to to fly to all over the world to get the money to build it. It's it's such a it's such a mess to finally have it, but here we just had it so quickly, and I felt like it's a blessing. It's really not. It's it's unbelievable. Right, right. And so tell me more about your father. What are, like when he was alive, like what were some of the life lessons that he imparted on you? You know, what what were some of the things that he that he uh, teaches you that stand out most for you? So I think first of all, the the life lesson I had for him is is always think about the others. Like never being too self selfish. Like sometimes we feel like, okay, I have my life. Um I would live in Israel if I have so many uh advantage to have this uh, school and kosher food everything is so easy so easy and be so close to the family have this help of family but my my father never thought about the the easy way it was always like you need to do the, you, to, you need to do this you have to go through challenges and when you go through challenges and you succeed then you feel like you you have your own goal and you didn't like get it as a present right right yeah so he was working very hard on his goals he was very um uh he was a a person who took a lot of challenges in his life he he started an um, application he made a lot of um how do you say it uh yazamut it's i'm not sure <laughs> so he, he he had a lot of ideas that he invented and he wanted to to do an application for this. So oh, for like a patent because he wanted to get the the patent for it. He wanted to so so nobody else could copy his invention. Yes. Okay. Yes. So he had his inventions. He wanted to do application. He wanted to do stuff that are very very big for a normal person that has nothing to do with this. But he wanted to do this. He had a very he he was very into his goals. And he he never gave up, never. And I learned this from him, never gave up. And also the second thing I, I learned from him is to open the mind, like always think big, don't think small. Uh, for example, he wanted to build a house. Uh, we're a very big family. And he was thinking, okay, I'm going to build a house. I'm going to build a house. 
they're going to be a, a house of shluchus. And how, I'm how am I going to do this? I'm going to build the house in the shape of 770. Wow. Okay. So we actually built our own house, our family house, as the shape of 770. And he brought the, the stones from Africa. And he brought people who is... It, it was very difficult. But he, we have a house. Our house, our, our family house, is a shape of 770. It looks just like this. And it's a private house. It's not a synagogue. It's not a shul, nothing. It's it's a private house. And the people always in the street, they go around and they stop and they knock on the door. What is this place? Do you have like anything like lessons? Do you have anything special to do here? Because it, it doesn't seem like a private house. Right. It seems like a, something special. And this is this is like thinking big, not thinking small. But that's so unique. I would never have thought of it. For for those who are not familiar, seven seventy is the place um, um, in in Brooklyn where the Rebbe, the Chabad Rebbe, um, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, he had his prayer. He led his prayer services there. Yes. Um, and, I, and I've been to the building. I have the the shape in my head, and I can't believe that your house is like that because it really it doesn't look like a private house because it's seven seventy. If you ever anybody goes there, it's not a private private house. It's a synagogue. So yeah. wow. So, but I can imagine that big central space in the middle. That's where you hosted everybody, where you had the events, what you had, where you had your Shabbos meals. Is that right? Yes, we have a very big hall. Yes, and this the salon and the living room. But it's a private house, and, yes. and the, inside of it, it's a private house. Like we have the rooms for uh, the rooms for the 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 members and the family, but outside you can never guess. So this is a very special thing that goes with me all the time. I'm I'm sorry, I'm a little sick, so I'm coughing. But I think that's really, really amazing. That's so unique that it's it's to your to your father's credit that he thought big. Mm -hmm. He really did. Like you weren't kidding. Like when you said he thinks big, he thinks really big. When we came to the island, we we thought, <laughs> okay, let's take a little place and start the activity. And I, I said to my husband, no, we have to take a very big place to have the synagogue, to have the hall, to have the lobby, to to feel like, to let the people feel like we were hosting them in a in a very how do you say it? pleasure way like don't don't come into my house it's not comfortable no I want them to feel comfortable I want them to feel like this is a place I want to stay um this is my goal like people coming to the island to 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 vacate for a vacation then they they need to fill the vacation also in the Chabad house so this is our goal that's so beautiful I love that I love that. Okay. So going even, even further deeper into our topic about honoring your mother and father, I want to talk about the actual mitzvah from the Torah, the Torah commandment of honoring your father and mother. Can you please share with us what it actually says in the Torah about honoring your parents and how we're supposed to show them that honor? Yes. So the Torah is talking about honoring um, the parents. Um, and sometimes we think that honoring the parents is listening to them and do everything they say and to be very strict about what they say and not go other ways and sometimes people are not really they they feel like they they're not connected to this kind of mitzvah because sometimes i don't agree with what what my parents say sometimes i can't do whatever they want me for example they want me to learn in an university and i don't want to learn in a university i want to do some business or something like that and I feel like the, the, the mitzvah is about honoring. It's not about doing whatever they say, but let them know I'm honoring whatever they say. I have the I have um I have a very special uh I'm listening to whatever they say, but with an honor, I'm deciding to do whatever is good for me. But I never say any bad words. I don't let them feel bad. I don't hurt them. Um, if, for me, it's very um, important to, for example, I have my mom now. It's very important for me to feel, to make her feel happy all the time. And I understand people who doesn't feel like that, who who is very struggling with honoring their parents. I, I understand that. 
Um, but sometimes honoring is not just listening to them. It's like let them know that you're listen that you you can listen always to what they say, but um to listen and 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 honoring whatever they say. And so, and like, if you disagree with them, like, for example, like you you were saying, sometimes they want you to do something that you don't personally feel is right for you, for example. So you give them the respect by listening to them, by hearing them out, by hearing what they have to say. And then... Yeah, respecting them. Respecting, listening, respecting. But then you can decide whatever is good for you. Right. So exactly. So I want to go... I I Because I have this question that I was going to ask you, but I really want to bring it up now because it's a perfect timing. Like, what if... Your parents want you to do something for against the Torah, for example. Let's say you're you you know your parents are not religious yet. Like you said, your parents are, are Balchuvot, right? Yeah. They they became religious later on in life. Yes. So let's say so let's say it wasn't your parents who let's say your parents are not religious. Let's say, for example, and like the child becomes more religious, and as they grow up, their parents are still not religious, and they don't like it that the child is religious. But the child wants to keep Shabbat, wants to daven, wants to keep the holidays. You know. So this, is, yeah. this is a very good question because this is um my father when he became Balchuva, his mm -hmm. parents were not religious at all. Mm -hmm. Actually, they were against it. They were always like talking to us as a as a grand as a grandchildren. One day you will realize that your life is not real and your life is not good this way, and you'll leave everything. You won't do these mitzvahs any when you grew up and and what I see about my father was that was very special. And that's what I learned from my life, that he never, never, never argue with them. He would never say, don't say this to my children. Don't don't make them feel this way. They they do a bad things. He was always like silence. And he, he said to us, just don't bother. Don't bother listening to these kind of things because we know what we do. We believe in what we do. And. But he never said to his father or his mother, I don't agree with you. This is, uh, this is, a, uh, you don't respect me when you say this to my children. He was always in silence and he always um, visit them. He never said, okay, they talk to us this way. We're not going to visit them. He visited them every um, Mose Shabbos. We went to their house, to their house to, to visit them. Just to say hello, that's it. And until they died, they died uh, four years ago, both of them. I'm sorry. Yeah, just right before he passed away. You know, my fa my grandpa passed away, then my father, then his mother. So okay. they all passed away in the same year. He was always respecting them without any question. He came, he came, he visited them, he took care of them. And they were not religious. Right. They didn't like the way he became. They didn't like their very were very big family, you know, the, the Orthodox family who have a lot of children. They don't take care of the children. So they had all these kind of stigma. How many and, how many are you? Like you and your brothers and sisters? We're eight. You're we're eight. eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're seven sisters, one brother. Wow. And they always were saying bad stuff. They always say bad things for us. Like they told us, uh, go get a, a boyfriend, go get a, a job, go get this and that. But my father never talked bad um, behind their back and in front of them. Never. That is so special. I just want to, I really want to recognize that because that's really special because that's a tough situation. Like your grandparents really put your father in a tough situation because, okay, yeah. they don't like what he's doing. Okay. That's all right. But then he's telling his, they're telling his kids, don't listen to your father. He, what he's doing is wrong. Like that's taking it to another level almost, you know, they give your yeah. father a lot of credit, like that. He didn't, he didn't cause a fight. He didn't yell. You know, he was just silent. He was so smart. I love this. Yeah. He was so smart because he, he, he was very sure on his way. He right. didn't need to any, he didn't need anybody that would say, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it right. He was very sure on what he decided to do in his life. And we felt it. We felt it as a children. We felt that our father is leading us in a good way, in a, in a, the right way. So 
even now when I'm remembering this kind of situation where my grandpa is like telling me go get a boyfriend or go get a, a learn in the in the university I don't feel like it's something that would change me because I'm very sure in my way you get that from your father I bet <laughs> yes yes that is so beautiful so now, so now I have an interesting question because your father sounds like a, such an awesome person, but not everybody is lucky to have a wonderful father and a wonderful mother. Some people honestly have parents who who abused them, who mistreated them, who neglected them, who didn't show up for them. It, it, you know, just really, really horrible situations. You know, so in that situation, you know, how can you how, do you have still have to honor your parents in that situation? And if so, how do you honor them? Like when they like were so bad to you. Yeah, so first of all, we have to understand that they they grew up sometimes in a very harsh families. Sometimes they have their the history of the parents are very hard. For example, people who came from Russia or they came from uh, there's a lot of examples that people that lives a, a very difficult life, um, so they have this um, tough energy in the in the house. So we have to understand that our parents were, were, they affected, they get affected from this kind of of, of life. But sometimes we have to understand that we're not going to live with our parents all the time. So our life is our life. Our parents' life is their life. But we have to respect them because they gave us life. They gave us life. Right. Without them, we wouldn't be here. So first of all, you have to say thank you. They feed us. They they brought clothes for us. For us, they gave us house. Uh, they gave us home. Okay. So about the abusing, um, sometimes you have to take a, a psychologically psychologic um, uh, treatment to understand where where does this come from. Because the parents is not always want to trigger you. Sometimes the parents doesn't really know he hurts you. Most of the time, most of the situation, uh, sometimes the mother has a difficult day and he, he's like beating the children. It, it's not about the, the children. It's about what she, she's been through. Yeah. So the child needed treatment. That's what I think it's very, very important because I know a lot of friends who feels like um, they had a very bad connection with the with his father or or mother and when they go through a treatment and they understand this is not about the father this is not about the mother it's about what they go through then you can relax and 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 treat yourself better understand that you deserve better so respecting a parent who is abusing you is first of all first of all is uh, respecting yourself don't go into arguing. Don't go into a situation where it can lead to abusing. Um, I think that's my father did. He was silent because he knew that his parents are not very welcoming his way. So he was silent. He was not saying in a word. And when you prevent this kind of situation, you you know where not to go into. Um. Right. This is right. in general what I think about this. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a very good perspective because your parents are coming from a place where they, maybe they were abused when they were younger, or they were, like you said, maybe from communist Russia, or grew up where it was not okay to be who they were, you know, and they were just closed off and cramped up and not allowed to express themselves and be who they are. And then at, at, there comes a certain point in, in their life where they just exploded, and Sometimes they explode on their children, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, you know. Most of the, the stories I know, it's about the history of the parents, mm -hmm. what they go through, go through. And it's, it's you can't, you can't just judge them. I think you can't judge them. You feel, you feel bad that they hurt you, but you can't judge them. Right. And you have to respect them even still, even though whatever happens. Yes. You have to respect them not saying bad words, not hurting them. But as we say before, don't listen to what they say to you if it's hurting you. Right, right, exactly, like your father pointed out. 
Um, I yeah. know um, we talked a lot about your father. I just want to ask you um, about your mother. You know, since we're talking about honoring parents, I want to give both both the mother and father a little bit of a little bit of um, a play. So, is there something that you learned from your mother? So, my mother is amazing. I love her so much. Uh, one of the amazing thing I learned from her is actually um, hosting people. She she was the one who hosts. Right. Uh, my father opened the house, but she needs to cook and she needs to host the people. And she was very, very um, happy to host people. She always like looking for guests. And when she hosts, she hosts in a very big and warm heart. She made a lot of food and, and a lot of sweets. And she never think, oh, I'll save more for us and I'll, I'll bring the guest a little bit less. Never. She was always a open table with everything. And she also very, she's very connected spiritually. She's very connected. She used to do a lesson every Monday, a Tanya lesson. Wow. Uh, every Monday for 20 years. I remember this lesson since I was a little child until now. It's It's very she's she's dedicated she's very she knows it's it's important and she does it all the time even she even if she's sick she does it so the lesson is is always there right to keep to keep doing it and not give up just like your father like don't give up i like that they it sounds like they they worked very very well as a team as a couple together yeah it's not about like giving up. It's about she knows how special it is and she knows how how many blessings the lesson yeah. gives to the house. So she's taking it very seriously. Right, exactly. Because she knows, yeah, she knows how much blessing, how much bracha, how much abundance it brings to the house. So that's, yeah. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Okay. Uh, we have time for just one one last question. So I just want to see if there's anything else that you wanted to share with us. You know, since we're talking about honoring um your your mother and father, and we're also talking about your community in San Andreas, Colombia, I was wondering if maybe we can tie the two together. Like if you have any stories that you'd like to share about maybe about the families in your community, I'm sure there are some very, very special families there. Yeah, so the family in the community, um, what's special about them that they're very far away from their families. That's what's special about them. We're we're all together. Let's say we're all in this th in this team. So the the children of these families they all left the island. The children, they okay. all live in Panama. They live in New York. They live in uh, in Miami. The parents are the only one who stays in the island because they have like business and they don't want to leave their businesses. So. We feel like a very big family because we all we're all alone. Let's say, right. uh, so they became our family very fast. And one thing that I I really point out in this community that uh, there's a, one family called uh, Cebu family. They help us a lot, a lot, a lot. And the the father Jackie Yakov uh, Cebu. He's very dedicated to his family. So he fly every simcha they have in their family. For example, bar mitzvah, um, wedding, anything that ha that happening in the family, he's flying to be attended. He's not saying, okay, I'm in the line, I'm in the island, I can't fly. It's very, it's very hard for me. He's very dedicated to the family. He knows how important is the family. And I see it every time he's always flying to the wedding. He has like two weddings a week. It's it's incredible. And he's flying. He, he's not very healthy. He's not very um he's not very uh young to go and flying all the time. It's very hard. And he's he never gives up. He wants the family stay together. So this is something I, I learned from him because. Sometimes we say, even if we live in the same town, we say, no, it's hard for me to come to your bar mitzvah. I would rather stay at home. I don't feel well. He, there's no excuses for him. He's there for the event. And this is what keeps the family together. And I think if we're talking about honoring the parents, it's very important to gather the family wherever you can, because 
the family is the only thing that lasts in this life like friends they come and go and family this is the only thing that stays and you have to keep it together you have to keep it together and work work on it because it doesn't come this easily and for us as a family who lives very far away from the family we uh, for us it's very important to to visit a list at least once a year to see the family to see our families right because they're not going to be there forever unless the mashiach comes and then amen <laughs> yeah I mean, so I see it as a very, very, very important thing. Amazing. That was that was a beautiful way to tie everything up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebetzin Dazi, for joining us on America's Top Rebetzins. It was really, really a pleasure to have you with us. And may the tremendous learning that we did today bring of Rafua Shalema for Devir Ben Hagit, Eden Ben Aliza, Eden Ben Or Orin, and Elat Bat Rachel. Thank you so, so much. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome.